And it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Devin Elton Savage, DMD. Um, I don't know who, if he was named after Elton John or Elton John named himself after that. I'm assuming Elton John named himself after Devin Elton Savage, DMD, who grew up in Sacramento, California, and also in Newark, Ohio. Graduated from Miami of Ohio and Oxford, then studied cell and molecular biology at New York and Pittsburgh before he finally saw the light and went to dental school at the University of Pittsburgh, class of 19. 1997. After dental school, he went to the U.S. Army. Thank you for serving. Was sent to Texas, Georgia, and Germany, then into private practice in Ohio. Also worked in prisons in Ohio and finally moved back to Germany to finish out his career. He is most passionate right now about his work on the arch lifter neck and spine fitness device that he invented and currently uh, working um, to patent to alleviate his own neck problems. It has proved to be a great help to avoid surgery. He has a corporation now and he is manufacturing them and selling them on his website, archlifter.com. There's a huge thread on this in dental school, <clears throat> on Dental Town. That's why I brought him on the show. I, he partners with his brother, Thomas Savage, um, who has an MBA and two others. Uh, he handles sales in Europe and all design and manufacturing decisions. They have two designs, their original design, now called the Type 1, and a new cheaper to manufacture but also effective design, which is called the Type 2. Uh, since he developed the Type 2, sales have started taking off. He had some good feedback from new users. Surprisingly, they're mostly in their 20s to 50s. The older crowd is not so engaged with the device, even though uh, they have users who are older. Uh, by the way, Mike Mew, who was on our podcast a while back, has an arch lifter. A few townies have one. Um, he's had his now for over five years, and he's well-versed in them. Another thing he's continuously interested in is disasters when things really don't go as planned. One of the first three members was the Challenger disaster, which happened when he was an undergrad, and it happened to me when I was in dental school. I'll never forget when George Rui called me up. He's my roommate. There are five of his dental students living in a house, and George calls me up and he goes, Dude, did you just hear about this Challenger? And I said, I know. I mean, it was just a shocking day. Um, he has read some books on that and many other disasters. And he has uh, had some of his own. In particular, was a case where a 24-unit apartment property owned was taken by the state of Ohio in an eminent domain case of the commercial rental real estate he owned in Ohio. Much has been plagued with problems. And um, it makes him think he should write a book on it. Um, speaking of disasters, you're never supposed to talk about religion sex, politics, and violence, uh, but um, everybody wants to know, uh, especially when I'm talking to townies on the other side of the pond. I mean, we're over here, the Americas. Uh, we're on the wrong side of the earth. There's only a billion people over here. <laughs> the other seven billion are all in Africa, right. Europe, and Asia. Um, when, you, right. when you study uh, Sapien, the first 200,000 years, it was purely an African game. And now when you look at babies being dropped, uh, the herd has 300,000 babies a day. Three are Asians and one's African. So Europe and the Americas don't even uh, don't don't even make the, uh, the replacement pool. But um, this COVID-19 um, has been a huge disaster. And um, not to get political and all that stuff, but you lived in Germany where they had a woman president who was a scientist. We lived in America that had a man president, um, and now we have a new man president. And I was reading a study that the that the um, the way the epidemiologists grade everything that the the only people who got an A on the grade were all the countries ran by a woman. There was one in New Zealand and Germany. All the women did amazing. And I've always been into this because we're sapiens, where the man is twenty five percent bigger than the woman, and they kind of rule by force. Chimpanzees are the exact same size, so they have a whole different um, success strategy, and it's with the size of their testicles. Um, they try to um, put in four or five million um, sperms as opposed to someone that's smaller, maybe four or three million, but they're the same size. And then there's bonobos, where actually the female is the dominant leader, and the males are the, the working ants, kind of like blue whales. The little girl swims down the middle, and she calls all the shots. And we have some bonobos rule in this planet, and Merkel's one of them. <laughs> the lady in Australia is one of them. And uh, without getting, uh, without pissing everybody off uh, talking about uh, these uh, horrible things, um, since you're an American and a German, and you've lived on both sides of the pond, what did you think were the basic takeaways between Bonobos, uh, Angela Merkel in Germany and uh, Homo sapien uh, Trump, now Biden, in the USA? Interesting that you mentioned that because my wife was uh, worked with, actually not 
not apes, but monkeys for, for just about 20 years. And when she saw Trump, basically she said, oh yeah, you know, this is, I've seen this kind of behavior. The alpha male likes to climb up the tree and uh, basically, you know, they, they don't hold their, their excrement. It just comes right down on whoever's down there. And, uh, you know, I, I heard a lot about that whenever she would see Trump. You know, we're not really that political here either. Angela Merkel, she's been here. She's been in charge about 15 years. She's on her way out. Uh, one of the things she did here is I think she, she was just deferring to the EU on, on vaccines. What did the EU do? Basically, they trade off process over speed. They focused on low price, liability, the vaccine companies for, you know, any adverse events. Um, I think it was an abundance of caution on their on their part. Uh, you know, they you know they had a hard time getting vaccines actually produced or, or at least approved, like this uh, Oxford vaccine. You know, it just seems to be one problem after another with this uh, vaccine. But the actual homegrown vaccine, this is the Pfizer BioNTech one or BioNTech or however they uh, pronounce it. Actually, there's another vaccine company that has very similar technology right here in Tubingen. And it's called CureVac, and uh, it's going to be partnering, I, I guess, with was it Bayer? Bayer, they call it in here in German. Um, and I guess they're going to be making something like 600 million doses. But anyway, yeah, the 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 thing about Germans is, I have to say, I have to give them credit. They they spontaneously comply with masking requests. I mean, they actually put on their mask. You don't have to. You know, plead with them. You know, have, you know, store owners. If you're if you have the wrong kind of mask, they tell you you got to go out out to your car and get a different mask. Whatever. I mean, I, I have to hand it to it because you know they live packed in here pretty tightly. When you see the way they are packed in on a train, you know, you 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 know, it's not like we commute all. I mean, lots of Germans do commute by car, but a whole lot commute by train, and you know, this uh, they have to take it seriously here. Um, vaccine passports, I, I don't understand the conservative backlash against them, but I, here's what I do say. I mean, we don't have you know, tuberculosis passports. We don't have, you know, uh, measles and mumps passports. I mean, you know, I think, I think there's going to be a, a time when coronavirus just kind of disappears or kind of goes on to the back burner. And we don't really need, we're not going to need a vaccine passport. But here in Europe, I think it might be uh, it might be a thing because they're slow here. Uh, they want to, it, it's an abundance of caution. Uh, you know, they're uh, right now, I think the only vaccine you can get is, is the BioNTech Pfizer one. Uh, I've heard people asking if, if, or wondering if we're going to get the Russian uh, Sputnik vaccine here. I don't know if you've heard, but that's a good one. It's over 90%, I guess, effective. Uh, it's a two dose one. Um, uh, the Americans here that I know, they, they say they don't want to, to get a vaccine that's not approved in the U.S., so they won't take this Astra, AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, the way that uh, Americans did this thing with the, what do they call it, the Warp Speed, Operation Warp Speed, I think was the name of it. And right. here in, in Germany, there wasn't anything like that in, in Europe. As far as I know, I, I don't know of any, I don't know. Uh, special initiative, huge special initiative that the Europeans had for this problem. They basically focused on prevention and, and you know, by and large, prevention did work. Uh, it didn't work very well in Sweden. They have a bunch of, they had a bunch of deaths there in Sweden. Um, Germany, from the last time I looked, I think Germany was up to maybe almost not quite 80,000 deaths. Sweden, you know, it's a very small country about the same population as Ohio, I think they had 13,000 deaths. UK was somewhere, I think they were above 100,000 as I recall. But the UK's done great. They've, they've got over 35 million vaccinated. Here in Germany, I think we might be pushing 10 million uh, vaccinated as opposed to the UK's 35 million. But, but the US, at, I don't know, what's the US now? I think they're, they must be, oh, uh, getting approaching uh, i don't know they must be approaching 50 million 100 million i'm not sure oh it's well over 100 million is it 100 million okay yeah yeah but but okay. you know i was i was wondering though what you thought i mean um you know about the um you know 
the 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 bonobos factor. I mean, um, the fact that I mean that we're yeah. we're seeing this and no one wants to talk about it. We're we're supposed to be delusion that oh, boys and girls are exactly the same and there's no difference. And and you know, most of us, if we were lucky, we're about 16 years old in the back of a truck on a dirt road and found out there were some serious major differences uh, between right. girls and boys. And and Merkel was the first. Uh, she was elected in 2005. And uh, she was reelected in 2009, 13, 18. She's the first one to be elected chancellor in, G- in Germany. And I got to tell you, I mean, you look at German history for all the time, and she's the first woman. But I can remember I was a senior in high school. I think it was 79. I graduated in 80. And I was working at Sonic. And my dad had nine of them, and he was my hero. And we just heard on the radio that the U.K., I uh, just elected the first woman prime minister is Margaret Thatcher. And I can remember my dad. It kind of scared me because I have five sisters. And he looked at me and goes, what the hell would they do that for? I mean, it's just like <laughs> he, he couldn't believe it. And I just thought, yeah. God, I'm glad my five sisters aren't here to hear that. But um, do you yeah. think that, I mean, and I've, I've been, a, you know, I grew up with massive sexism in my old house. My mom put me in jeans, iron patches on the outside of the knees. I could play in the river, fish. You know, if I didn't come yeah. home at night, she assumed I went home with some other guy. But my sisters were put in dresses. If they soiled their dress, they were in trouble. If they weren't on the yard when the street light came on, they were grounded. And, um, and it, it's, uh, when I went to dental school, most people would say dentistry was a male profession. And now you go into the dental schools and over half the class is women. Dude, and I was women, just yeah. wondering, do you think, um, you're a student of uh, history. Um, nobody, America's never, um, um, elected a bonobos, uh, you know, uh, female dominant yeah. and, um, what, 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 what did you make of, do you think she managed different? Cause, um, I, 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 you know, every country, there's 208 countries so on dental town. The 50th form is, um, your, your, um, what, what I even call it? I call it, um, your dental town neighborhood to talk about local stuff. So we have one for each country and yeah. I posted in, um, the German form, uh, March 18, 2020 Germany, Angela Merkel's coronavirus address honored as speech of the year. And, right. um, and she's wearing a mask and does all that. And at the same, the same uh, two days later, March 20th, 2020, Trump throws tantrum over coronavirus question. You're a terrible reporter. And it was all over the Guardian. It went everywhere. And yeah. you, um, you're you born and raised in these two big monster countries of Germany and the United States. And the United States never had a woman president. And now women dentists are everything. Do you Did you see any succinct differences? I mean, you're a wise old man. What, what did you think of uh, Germany having uh. its first woman chancellor? Well, I think the Germans are uh, there. Well, well, first of all, there's a difference between the chancellor of Germany and, you know, it's just it's just it's not a big deal here to be chancellor. I mean, it, it's, it's not like being president of the United States. Little girls don't grow up. Not that I know of anyway. They don't grow up saying, oh, I want to be the chancellor of Germany. No, it's it's, it's not that way. It's it's a. Uh, it's kind of well, like I, a I, I can tell role. you what they want to grow up to be, because I I raised four boys. And now I, they have six grandchildren, and uh, so I got a bunch of granddaughters, and they all want to grow up to be either mermaids or unicorns. It's it, okay. It's, it's yeah. a fact. Yeah. That's and, a fact. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and they and, they think about it. They they spend a lot of time thinking if they really want to be a mermaid or a unicorn. So Chancellor, you're right. Chancellor has not come up yet. Chancellor of Germany. And, exactly. <laughs> and and not, not only that, but you know, like Trump was a he was a different kind of president. We weren't used to that. He was kind of in your face every day with tweets, comments whatever. I mean, he was a in your face president and, you know, Angela Merkel was not like that. And by that, by the way, that speech, I've seen that speech. What I realized when I was watching that speech that she understood that Trump probably didn't understand is that when you, when you have a public health catastrophe, you have to engage the public. You have to actually engage them and say, look, we have a problem. We have a crisis. This is what we need to do to get, you know, to get beyond this. And she did that. Trump, I think he was just like, yeah, it's going to go away, you know, or it's a hoax or, you know, the, the Dems did it, the Libs did it, whatever. And I mean, you know, like, and, and, you know, it left a void. It was kind of like that, that void right after Sputnik went up that I heard about, you know, I read about Eisenhower didn't know how to deal with it because he's, he was caught with his pants down. The Russians, the commies, put a put a satellite in space, 
And, you know, like, you know, and there was kind of like a space program in the US, but they didn't really want to talk about it because they were thinking about putting, you know, satellites in the air that can do surveillance. And they had the U2 project going. And, uh, you know, it's that void, that information void. And, and you know, people were too, too eager to fill that void with whatever misinformation they could possibly conjure up. You know, this, uh, you know, QAnon, this kind of stuff. And, and it just fills the, it fills the Internet. It's, it's all over the place. I was just astonished when I saw how many people are buying into this QAnon conspiracy. You know, it reminds me of these doomsday, the world's going to end. And then when it doesn't end, they're kind of like, oh, now we're, now it's something else, right? Isn't that kind of like what they're doing with QAnon? Something well, like I, I lived through that. I mean, my mom was extremely, um, extremely Catholic. And uh, I, so starting in like about the sixth or seventh grade, I had to start living through the end of the world, you know, every year. And you're right. Yeah. When it was, uh, oh, you know, you're, you know, you're in grammar school trying to study for a test. And the church and your parents are telling everybody it's the end of the world. And you're a kid thinking, well, then do I really need to study for my geometry test? And and then when it was over, it was just they just speechless. And then, yeah. you know, within a year, it was back again. And by the time I was in high school, I started getting belligerent, uh, telling my mom, you know, don't don't say this. You, you know, you're not a palm reader. You can't, and if, and if you could predict the future, let's go to the stock market, uh, or real estate. Let's, let's not do this end of the world stuff. But, um, uh, yeah, humans are, uh, batshit crazy. They just, uh, they just <laughs> are. And, uh, I'm convinced, uh, I'm turning 59 this year and this will be the uh, 59th year where I still think, uh, I'm the only normal person I've ever met. And, uh, my gosh, like even on dental town, I mean, gosh, darn, I, 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 you post a picture of somebody, uh, um, uh, it was, it was a guy that got shot in, in the dental office and, and some other ones where you would yeah. need to know emergency care. And then when my friends on, you know, just texting with my oral surgeon friends, like, uh, Jay Resnick and people like that, um, I'm learning a lot, but you post on dental town and it go, and they all complain because the, the picture was too, too gory. It's like, I'm sorry, oh. aren't you a doctor? You're yeah. a freaking doctor, dude. This is a real patient. This shit happened. Yeah. What the hell would you do? And they're like, well, it's yeah. too, it's too gory. It's like, well, then, yeah. then, then go sell Dr. <laughs> Pepper. I mean, yeah. you know, it's a cr crazy, crazy. But, um, yeah, it was uh, Germany's Angela Merkel, New Zealand's uh, Jacinda Arden, Denmark's uh, Meta Fredriksson, Taiwan, um, Sai Ingwing, Finland, San Marin. I mean, there's just uh, – I'm really interested in how um, these uh, – they do it differently. And uh, I, I think that's uh, pretty interesting. Um, so we'll get uh, – so just to clean up on COVID um, – um, Americans, number one, you know, they, they know the travel app, you know, where, where you're traveling. And right. at the peak of the pandemic a whole year ago, Arizona's traveling on the roads and everything went down 20%. Um, yeah. now, now we're back over 100 million doses have been administered. Um, you know, I'm in Arizona, which is the Florida of the West. And, you know, it's uh, they never, 80% of the people here thought it was a hoax and crazy and all that kind of stuff. But now it looks like the whole country just assumes it's over. And yeah. so I was wondering, did you get vaccinated? And is Germany done with lockdowns and all that? And do you see light yeah. at the end of the tunnel? And is this thing almost over? And one shout out to Sputnik. Um, the Germans, um, you know, they were the first one to put something on the moon. They just shot a droid there. They didn't see why I'm in there. They had the first dog in space, woman, man. These guys, I've lectured over there. The whole grammar school, high school education system is based on math, physics, chemistry, biology. And that's all they teach. And, and yeah. they have come up. I mean, the largest nuclear bomb ever made was Russian. So when they come out with, when they, they said they were going to do Sputnik, I'll tell you what, Russia's got a shitload of scientists. But the difference between their scientists and over here, and this isn't racist or sexist or anything, it just is, because this is what my German friends told me when I was lecturing in Russia. Uh, I mean, my Russian friends told me, there were townies like you, they said, well, you know, the difference between an American and a Russian is if, it, in America, if you're like the smartest programmer around, you'll, you'll start a new software company. But if you're a Russian and you're like the smartest programmer in town, you'll try to hack into Citibank. 
and uh, it's just it's okay. just a different culture. So that that's just what they do over there. They yeah. they, they it's more fun to hack into Citibank than it is to write some <laughs> customer relations uh, software. And that, yeah, that's just what they like to do. But 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 to those questions, did you um, get vaccinated? Is yeah, it over? Is the light at the end of the tunnel? Are we done with lockdowns? And, and yeah. most importantly, everybody wants to know the biggest dental meeting in the world is in Cologne, Germany, every other year. Uh, the IDF meeting. Um, it, what um, they're saying is, you think that's going to be live in person, or is that going to be on Zoom? Yeah, I, I would say there's not really any point in going to that unless unless it's a live in person. I would I would tell you I've I've been. It's it's huge. It's you need several days to see it. Nobody's going to be on Zoom that long, you know. Um, I I would say, and I think it's normally in I think it's normally in the summertime, but but they might push it to the fall. I don't know. Um, I would say, yeah, I got vaccinated. I got the uh, what they call BioNTech one here. I noticed that Americans call it Pfizer. Germans call it BioNTech because it's a it's a you know it's a product of Germany. Uh, at least the intelligent design the, that that uh, part of the uh, vaccine is uh, German. Um, yeah, uh, as far as I know, the, vac- the the lockdown was scheduled to end about the 15th or so of April. But I, you know, they could change if if they see the, uh, the new cases ticking up. Yeah, there's they can change it on a they can turn on a dime and say, hey, you know. We need to do another week. They were going to have us locked down over Easter vacation, and I, there was a, too much of a backlash against that because there was a short notice. So uh, that was canceled, but hardly anything was open anyway, you know. So you know, and and uh, yesterday Monday was was a holiday here too for Easter. So Germans have a lot of holidays, a lot of uh, religious holidays here. Way I, I think way more than we have in the U.S. And uh, so it, you know it's almost too much sometimes. And then you know the average German person gets you know pretty good uh, vacation up to thirty days a year. Or so there's a lot of time off here. So I would say yeah, it's uh, people here are big time travelers. You know you can be down in Italy and you know a short day's drive. Uh, Switzerland is just a couple hours to the south. France. I mean I could come home for from work and dr- and drive to France for dinner. You know when I when I come home early. Um, it's a great place to to be for travel, and yeah, and I, I would say yeah, Germans are ready to get out. And get, they want to get their shops open. They want to uh, to get out there and travel. And yeah, I do too. I haven't seen my parents in a couple of years. They live in Ohio, and uh, yeah, I would like to come see them. They're both in their eighties. Time to go see them. Um, we have a huge problem in dentistry. The reason I wanted to bring you on the show is because. Um, you know, the, the head, my head and your head, it looks like a 10-pound bowling ball. And um, we just, um, the older guys, um, we would just hang it over. Now, I remember all the way back in grammar school, um, I, I used to regularly visit me and John Lees, who's an uh, endodontist and out in L.A. We used to regularly visit the dentist on the west side where we went to Bishop Carroll High School. And, and I can remember Dr. Um, Peltzer um, getting mad at these young dentists who were sitting down in the chair. And he said, you got to stand up. You know, you got to you need your posture and, and um, you're going to go weak in the back. And he was very adamant about these sit down dentists. Now you f- roll forward three decades and uh, the oral surgeons are still all standing. Uh, but the dentists yeah. sit down. And you get you you're get you're you get um, intense or frustrated, and the next thing you do is you lean your head over and you use direct vision, and you know you're not supposed to do that. You know you're supposed to sit like you're looking through a telescope, periscope. But the bottom yeah. line is you just you, you just you want to do that, but you don't do that, and then then um, your your neck starts to get in trash. And then I had the added deal where my sport for me and uh, my grandpa and my uncles and cousins and now my boys and grandkids was wrestling. And when you're trying not to get pinned, you bridge off your, your head and your feet. And so you're lifting your back, your torso up with your head while someone's bouncing down on your neck. So I, I don't know what screwed my neck up more. Was it wrestling or dentistry? But I think the two of them together, probably one plus one equals three. And, um, and then, of course, Americans... 
or 5% of the population, not even 5%, like 45 but they take half the prescription pills in the world. And then the other countries, they like to try to, like, stretch or do yoga. Um, you know what I mean? I, I noticed that most startling in China, you know, in America, when your baby gets sick, you take a temperature and immediately give it Tylenol or ibuprofen or some pill or a drug. And in Asia, first thing they do is give it an enema. And then when I would come back and I would tell my own staff who's – doctors, nurses, in healthcare, and they thought giving their own baby an enema was just like beyond gross. So, you know, so now you're, you're talking to people, you're talking to dentists all around the world. Um, you know, do you think Americans, when they get a, ba- a bad neck problem, are going to want to take a leave? Or do you think they're going to want to actually do this physical exercise? But 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 um, for everyone that doesn't know what ArchLift is, um, you got to go to his website. It's really amazing. Um, I can't tell you the name of his dental office website because it's uh, like Zanarti Hashinjantad. It's Z A H N A R Z T hyphen A E S T H E T I C T I K D. What is that? Zarn Zarnhart Aesthetic. Yeah, it's just basically, it just means that it's aesthetic dentistry. That's all it means. Okay, yeah. and then you got a, so, um, then I got another one for you. But the archlifter.com is a really cool, um, really cool video. In fact, um, what I'd like to do now, Kyle, is um, he's got a great YouTube video on it that's uh, eight minutes long. Do you, would you want to insert that now or at the end of the, um, at the end of the podcast? Because I, I think it's very yeah. well done. Okay, would you, would not, you say yeah, would you say now or at sure. the end? I would say at the end would be the way to do okay, it. Okay, okay. So if you go to archlifter.com, talk about it says the ultimate neck and spine fitness device. How did a dentist like you get into this? We're, tell us your journey. Yeah, so well anyway, my dad had problems. Two of my younger brothers started having problems before I did actually. Uh one of them's a DO. Uh he was doing a lot of manipulation. He does some manipulation. Um uh, one of my brothers uh, spent quite a significant amount of time in the army. He was in uh, two of the Gulf Wars. I uh, wore a lot of headgear. Um, he started having neck problems before I did, actually. I started having about age 45, about 10 years ago, uh, approximately. Um, you know, I had all the postural problems. I, when I look back, I, before I started having the pain, uh, I, I really knew very little about it. Uh, and then I started, uh, you know, having the pain, started, you know, asked my brother and started, you know, reading about it, trying to get information. And uh, it started getting worse and worse. And then there was a point where, you know, it was my left, it was my left arm, which I had, uh, I had done, I had surgery on my left shoulder twice, once when I was, uh, you know, playing football, and the next was when I was in the army. Um It, uh, I first thought it was from that, but then I, uh, when my pinky my left pinky finger went numb and wouldn't type anymore i said oh you know that's a problem that's a nerve problem so uh i started seeking care and uh you know and i i found out that you know while the, the people were trying really genuinely trying to help me uh the the help was just so short-lived i mean it was it wasn't very long and i was back in there just it was you know it was it was constant really and uh, w- when you think about it i mean the the perturbation of the system that system of your you know your neck and spine is daily for dentists it's like you were saying you know we're we're hunching over our patients every day sometimes for hours at a time i work uh, 10 hour days two days two two days of the week uh those are my longest days my other days aren't so long but uh, over time, I mean, it just adds up, you know, and then, and then you, when you want to fix it, when you get your appointments once a week, once a month, once a year, or, you know, I mean, I'm sure it's, uh, it's definitely less than you need. So I started making a deep dive into the problem. I wanted to know the bio biomechanical basis of the, uh, of the pain itself and, and why I was having such a problem. So um yeah it was a it was a big revelation for me i i found out you know it's a structural problem the the spine i found out the the way the spine works how you know your posture daily posture changes the structural components and uh and then i also found out that the, the american medical system really is not designed to prevent your problem they they're they're there to fix it they're kind of like surgery I mean, that's basically what you're, they're telling you. You know, you're, they're just babysitting you with physical therapy until 
you need surgery. So, uh, of course, at that time, my device didn't exist yet. And I, when I started looking at the devices, and my dad had one of them, they put the traction point over your chin. So, you know, when you, when you look at an MRI, lots of people send me their MRIs. I've seen tons of them. And you see the squished discs in there, you know. Those discs have, there are two choices for your disc when it gets squished like that. I mean, number one, it could shrink down to fit the space. Or number two, it can squirt out, you know, it can extrude out of the space and into where the nerves are, basically, the, the uh, nerve roots that are coming out, uh, you know, behind the spine or the spine itself. And, uh, and what the, the medical system wants to do, they don't want to basically stretch out your spine and decompress your spine, uh, you know, without surgery. But basically what they're doing is they're, is they're removing the disc itself. And then and then they're fusing the vertebrae, or they're doing a, a keyhole surgery from the back. It's called a microdiscectomy. What they'll do is they make a little keyhole, use a, use a scope, and go in there and kind of remove any bone that's impinging on the nerve. And then they remove the uh, section of the disc that's sticking out. But you know, if uh, I I've found out that if you wait long enough, a lot of those things resorb on their own. But when you have to work every day as a dentist. And you've got that pain. I mean, that pain when you when you're living with that pain, it kind of kind of controls your life. It's it's living in pain is living in fear, really. I mean, you know, because it injects a certain uncertainty into the into the, into life. I mean, are you going to be able to pay for that mortgage? Are you going to pay for the car? Are you going to be able to pay back your student loans? You know, when is the big one going to happen, right? Uh, and then later in life, you start thinking, oh, you know, can I pay my child support and alimony? You know, you know how that goes. Uh, and and so uh, so anyway, I got the idea when I looked at my dad's device that went under the chin, and I said, you know, that's engineered wrong. It, it you know, the, it needs to be pulling from the base of the skull, and really, the the maxilla is part of the base of the skull. When you're putting a traction uh, a traction point. On the ma on the mandible, it's movable, and you know you you've you're loading the maxilla, yes, but you're also loading the TMJs, and it's not stable because it's a movable part of the skull. So I said, you know, you gotta you gotta load the teeth, you have to load the maxilla, and so there was the idea, and I you know I started out in my dad's garage in Newark because I I was getting ready to move to Germany at this time, so I I sold everything in in uh, I had in Ohio, so I was. Um, you know, working out of his garage. And then I made a prototype and then I uh, kind of put it on hold for a while. I moved here. And then, uh, uh, you know, when I got here, then I really started developing it. And I used a, a uh, an outfit in um, Columbus, Ohio, uh, a bunch of uh, out of work automotive engineers and professional engineers and you know, like great people work for this this design house, it's on one of my videos. It's called Priority Designs. They were fantastic in helping me uh, get my ideas to, into a physical product. And um, so the uh, so anyway, the, the prototypes that I started using, they were pretty, the ones that I made myself, they were pretty crude actually. And when I got uh, Priority Designs, yeah, it was expensive, but uh, the, the quality of those, those devices that I got from them was just wonderful. And the usability, and you know, they they asked me everything. They want to know about the user interface. What exactly do you need? You know, how how should we make every part? And when they what they came up with was was really great. So uh, I I probably couldn't have done it without them. I couldn't have done it as well as I did it without this company. So we started. Uh, I started producing those. We they're they're made right here in Germany. And uh, so I'm using a, a, a custom manufacturer here, and they man they manufacture other things, but they do uh, they do a real nice job on arch lifters. I'm real happy with them. So, yeah. So that's kind of the overall view of the story. So, um, so basically, you take I'm looking at this thread, and uh, this is a photo of a bite that you made for the use of the arch lifter. It's made from a putty impression material. It's made on the maxillary arch, and only need the occlusal surface, much like a bite registration. Uh, you did it by placing putty inside a tray about two-thirds full, and then um, 
So that's the device, and then you're going to put that into headgear that makes it um, um, connect to the rest of the device. Uh, t talk about how that, that's made. Yeah. So anyway, it's basically a, it's a metal frame. And, uh, you know, it took us a while to ex exactly find out where to put all the components, but uh, we're using the, the ear hole as the center, right? That's the center of gravity. So it's got a neck strap, like, like uh, in the back of the head, uh, or kind of like an occipital strap, I would say. And then in the front, uh, there's just a, 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 the whole thing is kind of rem uh, movable on around the axis. It rotates around the axis of the ear hole. So you can, you can change the angle to suit your need. And, uh, and then you, so you basically put the mouthpiece into your mouth and then insert it. This is the type one I'm talking about. You insert it down into the slot and then your head is cradled and it's very stable. Like you can, you can, uh, you can put, I can put my entire body weight on it. Lots of people can. You, of course, I wouldn't tell you, I don't recommend you do that. And I don't recommend that you start off, especially don't start off doing that because it just isn't necessary to get get to an effective advice. But um, but the, the basically, so you're you've got two points of traction, one in the front of the head, and one in the back of the head. I call that balanced traction because you're 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 not you're you're basically offloading the spine. You know the the head is a load, and you're taking the load off the spine. And how you take the load off makes a difference. If you, there's a device called the, what is it called? The neck hammock. It goes from the back only, but you're, it's off axis unloading of the spine. So you're basically pushing the head forward. I don't know if you've seen this neck hammock. The guy who invented it, it's not really his invention. It's just, it's just a slick marketing thing, but he, uh, I think he sold like 60,000 of them or something, but it only holds you in the back of the head. So it doesn't have any component to push you in the front. Now, the whole reason that's important is because as you lean forward, when you have this forward head posture, your vertebra, your, your discs in between your vertebrae start to look like wedges over time. They're not discs anymore. When you look at them, they're, they're wedges, basically. And so I think of them kind of like as a tube of toothpaste. Now, imagine a, a tube of toothpaste where the, the part with the cap is in the back. All right. Now, this is in between your vertebrae. So when you lean forward, you're kind of squishing on the tube of toothpaste, and that gelatinous, you know, interior of the disc, which is basically it's it's a gelatinous substance that attracts water, right? It squirts out the back where the spinal cord and the nerve roots are. That's the problem. So uh, as as we age, so so anyway, uh, to back up a little bit, uh, the spine is you know it's segmented. It's a bunch of vertebrae, and they've got discs in between. And then in the in the back of the spine are the uh, basically are the facet joints, right? And then the whole thing is held together by muscles and ligaments, like the muscles of the torso. Those basically help uh, you know stabilize the spine. So when you lean forward all the time, and you've got that forward head posture like dentists do, your discs start to look like wedges, and then they become prone to squirting out the the gel component now think of a disc as a kind of like a jelly donut that gel gets squirted out the back and that's the part that kind of pushes on your nerves and that's when you've got symptoms and usually in the u.s that's where that's when the you know the interventions start so uh you know this is uh and and these um these usually these this scenario happens in younger people because they actually have uh, this thing is, this disc center is called the nucleus pulposus. It's just kind of like a gel. Uh, they actually have a gel to squirt out behind. Older people, their discs are so flat that they, you know, they don't really have so much of that anymore. So, so anyway, the, the, uh, the whole spine works kind of like a pump. Each vertebra, disc vertebra works like a pump, like an accordion. So when you, you do normal movement, that accordion action squeezes together and pulls apart like an accordion. And when it does that, it kind of attracts, you know, interstitial fluid into the area. And it acts like an accordion pumping, you know, this interstitial fluid in and out. Of course, this interstitial fluid contains nutrients. That's what the cell needs, the, or the, uh, the cells of the uh, discs need. 
because these discs have no blood supply. So, uh, in, in people with uh, normal activity level, you know, this pumping action works and the, uh, the vertebra stays pretty healthy. Now you start to move to somebody like, you know, your typical American white collar worker has a, you know, a cell phone laptop leans into his or her work and they, they're doing that forward head posture. That's their normal now. They don't, you know, there's a part where they don't have discs anymore. They've got wedges. So, uh, so anyway, I basically, to, to visualize this, think of, a, think of a normal spine as a column with a bowling ball on top. That's axial loading of the spine, you know, to support the, head, the weight of the head. Now, when you start leaning forward, you've got a leverage effect, right? So, you're, so imagine taking a broomstick, putting that bowling ball on the broomstick and holding it upright and then moving it out forward. And you can imagine the leverage effect you've got. Uh, and that's what your spine has to do. And it, it starts acting more like a construction crane at that point. So it's got to kind of hoist that, that load up and down out front. But, you know, construction cranes have a, have a ballast or a, a counterbalance weight in the back to, to balance off of. So that kind of, um, that effect kind of works with the, the rib cage because the, you know, the thoracic uh, vertebrae are protected by the rib cage. So they don't really have a lot of problems, but it's the it's the lumbar, and it's the um, it's the cervical spine, the neck part that really really takes a beating, and so these discs that are right in between this the crane part and the counterbalance part, there's going to be a disc or two or a few in there that are going to take a real beating because they're right in between the two components, and those are the ones that look like wedges, and that's where you're getting your problem. So the the whole orthopedic surgery, neurosurgery, you know, installation that we have in the world, that's what they're primarily dealing with, that one little area. Uh, and, they, and they are basically using, they, they kind of babysit things with non-surgical. I got to be fair, they do try non-surgical first. They, they tell you, okay, just wait a while, it might go away. If it doesn't go away, go to a physical therapist, go see a chiropractor. Um, and that's that's uh, uh, that's the current state of of treatment. And you know, one of the things that's been um, uh, you know amazing to me is I've had very very few chiropractors and physical therapists try this try this device. There's there's very little curiosity about it. Um, I there's a, there's a physical therapist over in Luxembourg who has one. I've got a number of number of people. Uh, we've got a, quite a few Aussies who like them. And um, and some Canadians and some North American physiotherapists and chiropractors, but it's not it's not what I I had envisioned when I first came up with this device. I thought you know they're going to want to try this because you know it's so dang effective. It's amazing, really, when you think about the two choices of the discs. But you know a disc that's squished between two vertebrae. It's it's kind of like a uh, repetitive motion injury, really. Howard, I mean, it's it's like uh, you know bursitis or something. It's you're you're leaning forward just too often, and it's you know the system can't handle it. So what the arch lifter does is it forces apart the vertebrae, forces them apart, and it gives those discs room to heal. It creates space for healing, and you know that's that's something that it's hard to get with a non-surgical approach. You know, like you know, when chiropractors are kind of, they're like pulling you really hard, you know how they, they snap, right? You know, knowing the function of the, of the spine and the way it's set up to kind of uh, provide its own nutrition, I don't know how that's really helping the discs. It, you, it might be making a nice crack, and I don't know if it's getting any relief, but I, I would say the, you know, exercise, get the person moving, get uh, you know try to get them back into normal function so those discs can start getting their their nutrients basically because it's they have like I said they have no blood supply the other thing that they start doing after you know physical therapy if if it still doesn't work you know the, these discs the uh, the joints these facet joints in the back just imagine if you know if you've got a uh, nucleus pulposus sticking out uh, it was found that the the discs 
these painful discs have, you know, substance P in them. I don't know if you remember substance P, but uh, that goes back uh, uh, back a long way. It's a it's a peptide neuromodulator. Uh, it's important in initiation of uh, inflammation, and uh, it's uh, it, it's basically a big signaling device that uh, something's wrong. So you've got this inflammatory soup around the injured disc, around the injured facet joint, and uh, you know suppose uh, you know the the non-surgical interventions aren't working. The traditional one. What do they do next? They start giving you steroid injections. So they're going to do steroid injections. They're going to try to find out which level the the herniated disc is if they can't see it on a on an MRI, and uh, then they're going to um, because you know a person can have multiple uh, multiple um, herniated discs or even multiple bulging discs. And it, it's not so obvious, even on an MRI, it's not so obvious which one is actually causing the pain. You know, because the this substance P, these nociceptive fibers that are inside the discs uh, can be, you know, a, a patient can have as, as many diseases as he or she pleases. As you know, it's one of the first things we learned in dental school. And so any one of those uh, discs can be painful. And, uh, you know, it takes over your life. So, my gosh, let's just jump right into Dentistry Uncensored, hearing all of that stuff. Um, you know, um, you again, I, I'm, I'm really going on to, I got a really smart townie, been around the block, been around the sun, you know, 50 laps plus. Um, you know, America has a 25% C-section. I mean, I, I have one of my best friends had four babies and four C-sections because you get $5,000 for a va- for uh, a C-section and 700 for a vag. And then you go look um, at the socialized medicine, which is just this evil word. I don't know why it's evil because it has something to do with politics, whatever. But the first time socialism was ever used and what it really means is that um, uh, when workers were uh, wanted to own their own means of production, it was actually, um, you know, they... they you know, when, when when the evil government would say, okay, we're going to steal half your crop, you just did it because you didn't want to fight and lose a limb or a child. Uh, right. But when they come back and said, we're going to take half your crop and we're going to take your land, you're going to be a landless squatter peasant and give us half your crop. That's when they drew their swords and fought to death. Um, so it just means own your means of production. But incentives matter. I mean, I got an MBA, and if you think incentives don't matter, you're delusional. And um, so, you know, in America, um, I mean, my God, if the 35,000 orthopedic surgeons would probably get 25 grand if they did a surgery. I mean, shit, a, a, a knee is uh, 25 grand. Uh, a hip is uh, 50 grand. Uh, uh, a heart bypass is 100 grand. I, I went to MBA school and there were a lot of senior directors from hospitals and they said man the billing is so screwed up i mean it's like 25 dollars for an exam but a hundred thousand dollars for a bypass if we don't do three or four bypasses a day we can't pay all of our bills because we can't break even having a patient come in and talk to a doctor for 25 dollars. so the incentives are just completely insane i mean look at look at dentistry the one reason I hate socialized medicine is just because the government's involved and I can't find anything in 5,000 years of history uh, that makes them the hero. They're always the problem starter, instigator. They're always the nightmare. I, I, I got, you know, I'm a libertarian. I, I, I put all my egg in the individual. Uh, this individual has got to learn how to navigate 208 different countries and the, the the tribal leaders of those countries their their first tool is to kill you lock you up kidnap you put you in a cage and the second one is to steal all your money uh but i mean but incentives matter so who am i to trust an orthopedic surgeon who's going to get 25 grand to do neck surgery or a chiropractor um you know and uh so you've lived in both fields uh you've lived in the united states which is a um, fee for service and now you live in uh, Germany, which is uh, socialized medicine. Um, what have you learned on the difference? Uh, I don't want to say who's got the better system because I don't believe right and wrong. I believe the trade-offs. What, what are the trade-offs between the government-sponsored healthcare system in Germany? Uh, you've been to England several times, the NHS, um, our neighbors here in Canada, versus the United States uh, free-for-all where all the doctors are trying to do, build the insurance okay. for the most money. Okay, I'm glad you asked. 
So, <laughs> How are you? Oh my God, yeah. you must not have heard the question then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, yeah. Um, so I've had I've had actually two surgeries here in Germany. My mother's had one. She spent quite a bit of time in the hospital here. Oh, back about 15, 15 years ago. Um, and um, okay, it's different. It is different. And I'll tell you, like for example, you know, you and I were going to talk back in December, and I had a problem. And you guys can edit this out if you need to, but I, I needed a prostate operation. I had complete blockage. And I couldn't even, you know, it had been going and going and going. And, you know, they were trying, you know, Flomax on me. And, you know, I'm 50, I'll be 57 this year. Guys our age have this problem, right? Uh, so uh, the way it works here, we've got a urologist here in Tübingen. This is the guy you go to. He tries to solve your problem without surgery, with just medication. Uh, they're there uh, if you, you know, if if you need to have a catheter inserted, and you just can't go, right? Because I mean, you could you could die from that uh, if you can't get the the urine out. Um, but anyway, they refer you. They basically work on you until they can't. They they're out of solutions and they cannot do anything more for you and you need surgery. And that's exactly what happened to me. So they referred me for surgery. I got an appointment. I didn't have to wait six months. Like, you know, like uh, people say, I waited two weeks. And it was even during COVID time because I was told that they didn't really have as many appointments because of COVID. And, but they got me in in about two weeks. I had already been in the catheter for uh, more than eight weeks. I was in a catheter Back when we were going to talk before in December, I just couldn't even sit down. I, I just couldn't. I was so uncomfortable with that thing. But um, but anyway, they used a – when I went into the OR, I looked, kind of looked around a little bit. I saw a machine sitting there, easily $200,000 machine. Everything looked just the same it does, it does in the U.S. In, in an OR, you know, just as nice. They put me out, did the surgery, done – I stayed there overnight. The next day, I was on my way home. I had, I had a great experience. And, you know, it didn't cost me anything extra. I didn't even pay for the snacks. The only thing I paid for was $2 a day to have Wi-Fi. That was it. Okay? And I had a, I don't know what, I had a whole lap. It's called whole lap laser surgery, where they basically take out the inside of your prostate with a laser. And it solved my problem, and and I I'm not I didn't have to take a loan. My health insurance is not connected to my employer, or my employment, or my business. I buy I, you can buy insurance. In fact, everybody in Germany who lives in Germany is required to have health insurance. You cannot live here unless you have health insurance. So, and it's not expensive. Uh, it's based off of your income. So I, you know, my income is, is, is uh, you know, and, you know, it's, I'll say it's, it's above the 50% line here for sure. Uh, so I'm paying a, a higher premium, but I, I don't mind uh, because, you know, they take care of everything. I don't care if I'm paying a little bit more than the people down the street. It doesn't matter. I mean, you know, you know how Americans say, I don't want to pay for the, you know, the uh, the poor guy who never, you know, lifts a finger to do anything. No, yeah, I mean, people. That's a normal thing. Yeah, sure, okay. But uh, here in Germany, it's it doesn't seem to be a big deal. You can get private health insurance here. You can get a hybrid version of private and public. But I have public, and I think it's great. I get treated great, no problems. Um, in fact, so my next thing is I've got a a. a I've got a, a cataract starting in my left eye. I can still see pretty well, but I can see that I've got a cataract. I know I do. I have, uh, I, you know, I'm going to start getting that one taken care of. And, uh, you, you know, I, I will probably have to pay to get one of those um, fancy lenses where you can see up close, uh, medium, and then far away. Uh, otherwise, if I wanted to take the stock lens, I probably wouldn't have to pay anything. But that's my next thing. Anyway, I'm happy with my uh, with my German health insurance. I'm I'm really happy with the the uh, the health care I got here. Uh, I think my mother they saved her life. 
you know, and it was a very small town hospital where she went. And uh, one of my brothers, I got a brother who's an internal medicine doc. He flew over to just oversee everything, just to make sure everything was a okay. You know, they saved her life. And, uh, you know, and it was just a little itty bitty hospital. It wasn't like taking her to Ohio State or, or to, you know, Mayo or something like that. It was just, you know, and she had quite a problem. So uh, I, I want to take it. So anyway, social health care. Now, let's let's think about it. Let's think about this in the U.S. It's it's for profit. So the the insurance companies there, it's their it's their business to basically uh, to. Well, whatever their business is, <laughs> do they add any value to health care? Do they? I, I mean, I, it's a rhetorical question, I guess, because uh, in my opinion, they don't add any value to healthcare. They they don't have doctors. They don't have hospitals. They don't have research. They don't have medicine. They don't do. They don't conduct trials. All they do is is take money, and they they take X dollars and they pay out X minus whatever dollars. And, and in my opinion, they add no value to healthcare. That's my opinion. I, having experienced both systems, I would tell you that um, that in the U.S., you know, you, a German healthcare insurance company, and we have we do have health health insurance companies here, and they administer the government plan here, right? That's what their job is. You're never going to see their office in a skyscraper here. Okay, they don't make that much money. It's not like uh, you know United Healthcare or whatever, the one where the CEO had like a 1.8 billion dollar compensation, whatever one that was. Was that United? I can't remember his name. Anyway, I remember reading the article once that his compensation, his total net worth was 1.8 billion or something like that. And and this is his, the money he earned insuring other Americans. And you know, like you know, Americans think, okay, I'm paying for healthcare. In their opinion, they've paid for health care, but what they really have done is they've bought insurance, and the money for their health care has actually arrived at the insurance company. But they are going to the hospital, not to the insurance company. And how does the money get from the insurance company to the point of care, to the, to the dentist's office, to the doctor's office? It's, it's through the Philistines, I must say. You know, I've, I've experienced that. I practiced in the U.S. for 13 years. I know what it's like trying to get money out of United Concordia, out of MetLife, you know. Uh, and these people can make your life very difficult. Once I, I remember I, well, I did a let, let, let me just go on the record for what you said. So um, the um, CEO of Cigna, David Cordani, made $19.1 million last year. David Wickman of United Health Group made $18.9 million. Um, Bruce Brossard of Humana made $16.7 million. Uh, Gail Bordeaux of Anthem, $15.5 million. I mean, my God, yeah. I mean, think of uh, think, think of how much de- uh, for Cigna for $19 million or, um, or United Group, $18.9 yeah. million. Think how, much, how many dental claims uh, could have been paid for eighteen point nine million dollars, and um, uh, yeah, it's um, it's 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 crazy. I mean, yeah. um, I, and 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 here's my deal is um, you know, it's one thing when you come out of school and you got a bunch of student loans, and um, you know, all animals don't want competition. All animals want to run free. It's totally normal uh, not to have any checks and balances. But we know from five thousand years of history that absolute power corrupts absolutely. And if you have no checks and balance on you, I mean, look at Genghis Khan. He got a right. wild idea and realized um, there were these flat plains that ran all the way from Mongolia to Europe, and he hell he just got. 10, 20, 30,000 boys and just slaughtered everything on the way there. By the way, it was the rats that were with his crew that um, they um, um, laid the seeds for the bubonic plague, which yeah. killed a third of Europe. And then the Russians looked at that. And the Russians looked at that and said, oh, if they did it once, they do it again. So Russia used to thought those Ural Mountains would kind of protect them on the east side. And uh, so Russia, uh, Moscow formed an army and went down to the same plane that Genghis caught and pushed it all the way back. That's why Soviet Union is so big. 
They they just <laughs> went the other way of uh, Genghis Khan and all the way to the Pacific Ocean. I mean, uh, my gosh, and that left seventy five percent of Russia. Basically, it was Siberia. It hardly has any people on it. But um, um, yeah, um, they don't want any checks and balances. They want to do whatever they want. Uh, but um, you know. If there's not competition, I remember growing up before uh, when America, they banned the imports of uh, cars from Germany. And it was um, when they allowed those, um, when they got rid of that and those little Volkswagens came in, those little Datsun B210s, everybody laughed at them. But the American cars were crap. And it was that competition uh, that made uh, us great. But anyway, but back to the, the insurance CEOs. Yeah, so those guys rake in they rake in really a lot of money, and you know I have to I have to admit I have no idea. Uh, so my uh, insurance company is called Barmer. There's another one called AOK AOK here in German. Um, it's uh, I have no idea what the CEO. I I know nothing about their business structure or anything. What I do know is that they are are uh, basically um, there are companies that pretty much administer the the. Uh, the healthcare paperwork, they transfer the money and so on. And, and I, I would say, you know, Uva, he probably could, he probably could tell us more. Uva Moore, you know, um, he grew up uh, just, he grew up over in Sindelfingen, which is right across the Autobahn from where my office is. Uh, maybe Uva can, uh, you know, can tell me more about that. But um, I know a lot of people here, but we don't really talk about healthcare that much here because it just isn't a thing here. It's not tied to your employment. If you if your employer drops you here, you got the same health insurance. You know, you just start, you just pay less for it. That's all. You know, so. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to switch to another subject, a completely different subject. Um, you, um, you know, like I say, I've known you on the boards forever, and I feel like uh, I feel like you're the same bald brother from the same bald mother. Um, yeah. but you're, you're, you're a big, um, fan of, uh, dental implants. And what I like about dental implants is the fact that, you know, these kids are coming out $350,000 in student loans. And when you talk about socialized medicine, um, in Tokyo, London and Paris, three of the greatest civilizations that ever lived, uh, they only pay a hundred dollars for a molar endo. So I podcasted yeah. from those locations. Those they wouldn't tell me on the record, but they tell me off the record. Well, no, I can't do a root. I mean, I'm in Tokyo. I mean, the land's a million dollars a square meter. How the hell am I supposed to do a U.S. style root canal for one Benjamin? Are you out of your mind? So they just yeah. pull the tooth because just like when New York always does it with rent control, they say, "Oh, we're going to have rent control. No one can charge over a thousand dollars for rent. So no one builds any apartment complexes. There's no money, and it, and it makes situation worse. And in Europe and uh, London." and and, uh, Tokyo, uh, they don't try to save your toothache. They pull it, and then they do an implant because they can place an implant for $1,500. There's no insurance company telling you what your fee is, and then they can charge a $3,000. And um, and if they say, well, forget insurance, just give me a thousand cash, I'll do the root canal. Now it's an illegal crime. And, and back to rent control, the only reason the renting is a problem is again the government. It, it's all the um, it's all the zoning. It's like in San Francisco, the reason there's so many homeless is because all the zoning council wants to keep all those millionaires' views of the ocean and the bay. You go to Washington D.C., they have all these laws. Well, you can't block the the um, the Washington Monument. So so the government government once again breaks everything and then they want uh, and then they come to you and say well we'll offer you a solution uh, because you can't afford it um, Texas is the only state that has no zoning laws I mean you could buy a house in, in Texas and build the Empire State Building and guess what people don't do that there's a reason for that but Texas has the rocking hottest economy. We just saw Tesla leave California, go there. We just saw Hewlett Packard leave there, go there. We just saw Oracle. We saw, um, who's the podcast guy, Joe uh, Rogan. I mean, California is a, uh, I mean, it's just a, it's turning into just a complete what happens when the government uh, starts deciding they need to be the ones to make all the uh, uh, decisions because they're just so much smarter than you and I. And there's just no history of that. But anyway, you, you, you got into implants, and you're out there, and um, you love the uh, the Bicon dental implant. And uh, I'm trying to get uh, Vincent J. Morgan, DMD, the founder of that, to come on this program. I've been trying to get him to come on for a while. Um, but but Bicon, I remember when I uh, first bought the system, 
It was invented by Thomas Driscoll. Um, my God, that that was an interesting technology. In fact, when I saw that bike on, I had got all the way through physics and never even was taught that. But yeah. but will you will you go back to? Uh, I, I don't know what you're using now, but um, bike on's a big story. Um, why did you like bike on and that conical? Uh, deal and to tell us about your bike on journey because I just noticed even yesterday you just posted a, a bike on today. You said knife edge, a trophic 51 year old female, and you said, uh, check out the uh, this bike on um case uh, on the actual bike on uh, website, which is uh, bike on.com. But um, what why do you like bike on? Uh, a number of reasons very it's it's extremely simple. Uh, they you place them place them slightly below the crest. Uh, they they're very strong. I've never seen a broken bike on actually. Uh, it's, it's because I, I think one of the reasons is because the actual de facto uh, thickness of the wall includes the uh, the fins. Because you know it's 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 not a screw implant; it's a fin implant. And so, um, so I don't like them for everything. I like them for posteriors and multi-unit cases. But uh, yeah, I think the bike on is just fantastic, and it's a great device. You. You get bone growing over the edge of the platform, basically. It's what you get. I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, it was, I remember people calling, saying plat, plat, platform switching back in, you know, the 90s. And, and, uh, and I thought, oh, you mean like Bicon? I mean, basically Bicon style. So, uh, you know, like it's just, it's simple. You know, when you're, when you want to mix implant and Invisalign and Crown and Bridge and, you know, restorative, pedo, all these things together. You don't have time to be futzing around with a difficult implant, you know. Our first implant courses I took here in Germany was the Free Attack implant course. That was a complex system. It was, it was just complex. And, you know, it is no more. It's gone. I mean, one of the more comp- – I mean, there are a bunch of complicated systems out there. Bicon is the easiest and uh, and the one I use for for interiors, I still use them. You know, as long as I'll probably use them my entire career uh, is Ankylos for the interiors because when you when you basically bicons work best when they're loaded on the axis, right? If you're if they're loaded off axis like on a maxillary, there's a chance if it's not splinted to something else, it's going to dislodge the abutment out of the well. It's just a fluke of the system, but You've got uh, you've got basically a bicon with a screw, which is Ankylos, and uh, Ankylos has been in the U.S. since about '05, and uh, I adopted those because I recognized right away that the you know that Morse taper is uh, an amazing thing when you when you know you, you know if you look at older implant designs and you look at the uh, that section down below the screw right and the non Morse taper implant, yeah, they work. But do you want a septic tank down in there? I mean, you know, because stuff gets down in there. If, if it's not a Morse taper, stuff is getting down in there. And yes, I know people say, yeah, yeah, stuff gets through a Morse taper too. But I tell you, it's nothing like what happens in one of the old style systems that it does not have a Morse taper. You've got junk. You've got a septic tank under that screw. It's just a fact. And, you know, my, my wife has one. Uh, she has one. I didn't put it in. But she has one of those types, and she, you know, the implant's great. It's working great. But sometimes she gets a bad taste out of it. And, she, and I said, yeah, it's got a septic tank under the under the screw. Did anybody ever stop to ask the patient, do you happen to get a bad taste out of this implant once in a while? Uh, you know, I check around the implant. No, not really. No, no problems. It's just down in there. And, and when she really could tell where it was coming from, when I was doing aligners for her because she's, she would take out the aligner, you know, cause the aligner doesn't allow the mixture of the, you know, the saliva in your mouth so much kind of keeps things more uh, sequestered You take out the aligner and she could smell right where that implant was. And she could tell that's where the, uh, that's where that implant is. Now I I've got, two, I've done two bicons on her, you know, and uh, no problems. They're just great implants. Uh, the same with Ankylos. You know who likes uh, the same kind of implants as Bill Schaefer? Right. Um, Bill likes Ankylos. He likes Bicon. I think he's ma- mainly doing Ankylos now, but uh, it's the same kind of technology. I think Ankylos is also a great system. You know, Bicon, you barely even need to snap a seeding uh, film. 
because it's just, uh, I mean, they just go in, you have the patient to see the crown, you glue it on first, put it in there, and basically have the patient bite on a cotton roll. It's seated. It's done. You check the bite. Uh, if you need to take it out and do any adjustments or whatever, you can polish it up. You can polish it. You can adjust in the mouth if you want and polish. Uh, but but it is an easy, easy system, and it's very underrated, I think. Uh, lots of people say, oh, I want that index. Yeah, you know, I've done them since, uh, I've done them now for 20 years without the index. They make you the index. If you got a lab that knows what they're doing. So yeah. what what are all the um, implants uh, that use a Morse taper? Uh, I don't know them all, but I know there's a, I think Megagen is one. Uh, of course, Ankylos. Uh, I think a lot of the Korean ones are, are Morse taper now. Um, Explain yeah, the Morse taper. Um, we, we got a quarter of our listeners are still stuck in uh, dental kindergarten school, and they might not have got the uh, Morse taper in their uh, undergraduate um, physics, uh, which is really an engineering principle. But uh, tell, tell them about the um, Morse taper. Morse taper is different. So there, So if you think about the... Um, the, the way a telescope works, if a telescope is a tube within a tube, and and uh, there's no real seal there. But if you have a Morse taper, uh, they call that a, a, an interference. Uh, basically, what it's doing is it's 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 got a, like a 1.5 degree taper all around. So think of a kind of like an ice cream cone shape, but barely angled at all. In fact, it's it's almost uh, imperceptible to see it. You almost don't see the taper. It's so minor, like 1.5 degrees. And when you put it into something that's got the opposite taper inside, and you push it in, it's stuck. It's stuck in there. It's kind of like a, you know, a drill bit inside a chuck. It's kind of like the same thing. It's, uh, it's a friction fit. It's, uh, and the fit is so tight that the amount of, uh, the amount of biomatter the going in and out that that uh, uh, per- percolation of biological materials going in and out is extremely low it's probably you know as low as one under amalgam or something very very low uh, percolation and uh, so if you want an easy to use implant try a bicon just give it a try you know go take the course go talk to Vincent Morgan uh, and this and this happy crowd um, up in uh, Boston. They do they they give uh, courses a few times a year. I took this five day course. It's it's great. Um, you'll you'll really uh, be glad you did. The thing I do not like about it at all is the fact that the male portion is called a trunnion, and uh, and the other is just called the female portion. Why can't it just be a male and a female? Why do I have to be a trunnion? I mean, I just. <laughs> I just don't like being called a trunnion because I, I don't even know what the hell it means. What the hell is a trunnion? Yeah. But yeah, it was uh, 150 years of history of the Morse taper from Stephen A. Morse in 1864 to complications related to modularity in his arthroplasty. But um, it's a really interesting design that if they're each one and a half degrees, um, you just get this uh, Morse taper fit. And how would you describe that? one and a half degree Morse taper fit when you stick your trunnion into the female component. Yeah. So it's so strong that if you, if you really seed it all the way, you can't budge it with your fingers. You cannot budge it. You have to get a forcep to pull it out. It's really something. You just can't pull it out by your, with your fingers. Uh, the patient can't pull it out. They can't use tab. I mean, they can't use uh, you know, you could try, you know, how people will try with um, what is it? Uh, uh, Jolly Ranchers, you know, to right. heat them up and try to get them out. No way, you, you can't get them off. You have to, you have to really, you have to really pull them to get them out. But you know, uh, when I when, when I got my diplomat in the International Congress of Oral Plantology and my fellowship in the Mission Institute, I want you to know that um, um, all my instructors and all my implants. I mean, they were all placed with two dimensional panos. Uh, that we thought were just rocking hot. I'll never forget when I got the uh, pano upgrade and it put an R on the right side of the pano and an L on the left. I thought yeah. that was, in fact, when they came out with the CBCT, I thought, that's, uh, I've, I've already seen the right and the left. I mean, that was just, uh, <laughs> it didn't even hold a finger. Uh, but um, my gosh, back in that day, 
you wanted to design an implant that went all the way out the back of their head, wrapped around the moon three times, and came back down. And where you and Bill Schaefer changed the course of the discussion on Dentaltown um, was that little fat implants uh, work as good as the long ones. And I like that because I'm very pro little, fat, and short. Uh, I don't <laughs> like anything tall. And uh, 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 But um, my gosh, look at the sinus lifts. I want to ask you, I'm going to hold your feet to this, uh, this question. Um, what percent less sinus lifts are you doing now that you went to short little fat implants? So I'm doing, uh, I think I've done two, two lateral sinus lifts in the past three years, three or four years. And, how, and what done, was it like at the height of your implant mania doing sinus lifts? You know, I've been using Bicons my entire career, so I've never really done a huge amount of those lateral sinus lifts. I usually do internal ones. I usually use percussion. I'm always afraid of, a, you know, dislocating a, a retina or something, but I never have. You know, I just have my assistant hold on to the patient's head. Uh, I did one where I had a knife edge ridge recently uh, on a woman up in Heidelberg, and uh, I was, I was, I hardly used the, you know, the implant motor at all. And the osteotomes, I mainly used percussion to split that ridge. Uh, and for that one, I put an, an ankylos because it was an anterior, but uh, same idea. Anyway, it's, you, you know, it's, it's surface area. So we're talking about surface area here. So with those fins and the short uh, fat type implants, you get a lot of surface area on those. And, uh, and I tell you, they're, they're just wonderful implants. Another thing about using shorter, you know, smaller implants is if you do get a failure, if you do get a break, you don't want your trefline butting up against whatever's mesial and whatever's distal of your implant. You want to be able to trefline that implant out, get it out without you know making a giant hole, and uh, and then redo it. So, you know that's one of the things I really uh, I really pay attention to because you know, well first of all since you've got uh, you've got a implant with fins and they're not uh, uh, it's not a screw, you can't unscrew them. If you try to, you know, they're not going to budge. It's, they're really in there. Luckily, you don't have to take them out. So, uh, Viacons, when you put them in there and they osseo integrate, you know, they are in there. And, and that's a good thing. Wow, that is uh, interesting. Um, I want to. Um, we, we've gone over an hour. I know it's uh, uh, your, past your bedtime. Um, um, I still got some questions. Can you stay for uh, a little bit of overtime on these? Sure can. Um, I remember back in the, um, you know, we, we've had several revolutions in dentistry. One was uh, um, the Rentkin inventing the x-ray wasn't, didn't even affect dentistry until the beginning of dental insurance companies and the, uh, um, the, um, the Longshoremen's Club after World War II, the president said, uh, you're not allowed to let, um, raise wages. So the union said, okay, well, then give us free dental. That was the whole birth of dental insurance because of Roosevelt's belief uh, that you can't give a raise uh, during a war. Um, yeah, how, how, how his mind worked, I don't know. I wasn't there. Uh, but um, the trade-off of that was dental insurance. And uh, they came out covering x-rays, cleaning exams 100%, and like a domino, everybody was like, what was that Rentkin guy's name like a century ago? Yeah, we, we need that tomorrow. And x-ray machines flew across the country. And then um, there was um, Bob Ibsen and those people started doing some adhesive dentistry. Once they got the bonding technology, that would give birth to the um, cosmetic revolution. And kind of Iva Claire was the company that really rode that out of Liechtenstein. And I remember at being in Liechtenstein, which used to be part of Germany, and they um, would laugh at the Americans and the Middle Eastern for being clown white. I mean, they're like, come on, man. We, I mean, it's white. I mean, it's not, we don't need it that white, but the Americans wanted Hollywood weirdo white. And then the Middle East, I mean, if you're a girl and you're covered in a cell, a uh, sorry, and a veil, and the only thing shown is your eyes and your mouth and your nose and your teeth and, and the veil's black. I mean, you want some Clorox white teeth, and it looks rocking hot, clear across the mall. Um, how is Germany with cosmetic dentistry today? Do they still think uh, the Middle East and the Americans are uh, too Disney white and uh, looks funny? 
Are they more, uh, you know, what does cosmetic dentistry look like in Germany? And plus, you see it in their dress. I mean, I don't want to piss off a bunch of people, but I mean, um, you know, a, a 65-year-old man or woman in Germany or England looks like a 65-year-old man. But a 75-year-old lady in Paris, she's still rocking it, man. She's wearing pumps. She's got on her makeup. She still looks hot. And um, so, so what does the German... Uh, view of cosmetic dentistry look like today? Uh, so from what I, yeah, there, there is a component there, especially for the ladies. They like to have their teeth looking good, no doubt. But there, but there is a component here of, you know, the, these, the Germanic countries, from what I can see, and I'm no expert, but um, yeah, the Germanic countries are less about the looks, for sure, absolutely. Uh, a lot of them, I mean, you know, tattoos are a big deal here. Um, you know, the, the, um, uh, a lot of German ladies have this, uh, they call them an Arschgeweih, basically, basically ass antlers is what it means. Um, uh, and what is an ass antler? An ass antler is, well, it's, I don't know, it's like a curly Q type of thing on the back of, Lots of ladies here, at least it used to be. I don't see them too much anymore. Is that what they call the, the tram stamp? Yeah, I guess maybe it's that, yeah. Maybe Which everybody that. names it wrong because in Lady in the Tramp, the tramp stamp is to, they called is her the, a tramp, and the tramp stamp is to attract a tramp. The tramp is the, <laughs> is the male dog, the male dog going around right. chasing everybody. Uh, it's yeah. a tramp stamp, but you can't call the woman a tramp. And right. uh, by the way, uh, um, my girlfriend uh, has a... Um, a four leaf clover on her lower back. And uh, yeah. she, I said, isn't that cool? You put a four leaf clover and it attracted me, an Irishman. And she goes, I know. She goes, I knew it was going to work. I would have put an NBA <laughs> basketball on that thing. And uh, so uh, anyway, so sad, sad by story. The way, by the way, have you traveled to Ireland yet? Oh, yeah. Have you been to Ireland? Absolutely, man. My gosh. And uh, and sent my uh, family there. And, uh, yeah, we did the whole family tree thing. And uh, I, I did that several years ago when Ancestry.com came out. And I had four boys. So, for Christmas, I spent all this time, did the whole family tree. And basically, it shows that um, what they think is, um, um, well, anyway, they, they came over during the Irish diaspora, which is like 40 years before the uh, um, the um, um, Ellis Island was even made. And um, they came into uh, Canada, and then they came into the United States and Ohio, and then over to Kansas, and that's where we are. And I showed it to my boys, and one of the four boys said, you mean we used to be Canadian? And it was like, <laughs> it, ruined the, it ruined the whole present. I'm like, well, yeah, Zach, it's, I mean, look on the map. And, and uh I'll never forget it. He, he was young at the time. He was the youngest one, but I thought that was so damn funny. He thought we came straight from Ireland to the United States. So when he found out that they stopped in Canada, he was like disappointed. Uh, but yeah. uh, but why, why do you ask? Oh, what, what? oh it's one of the be most beautiful places. Well, you know, I've got some Irish too. So uh, yeah, and, and my ancestor that I am named for, by the way, uh, was, in how, it was in Nova Scotia uh, before he was stopped in Nova Scotia. On his way down to Ohio, I guess. I think it was Ohio that he went to, as far as I know. But somewhere in the Midwest. But anyway, yeah, lots of Irish here in, in, in this uh, in this American. Uh, um, mine, I, yeah, I guess mine came from County Down up in the up in the north. I, love, as, I guess that's where the name came from, anyway. Yeah, so, American uh, history is wild. When they started, when they voted on the Constitution, um, English beat out German as the official language by two votes. Yeah. And imperial math beat out metric by one vote. So we were three votes away from being German and metric, uh, which means maybe uh, so that, that we were within three votes of being able to make a car. Uh, yeah. And we've had uh, the Chevy and the Chrysler ever since. I couldn't believe it. I, when I was at ASU, um, that was when that Mars probe uh, slammed into the earth because ASU and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory were each making half of it. And one of them, uh, I won't say who, uh, was doing it in miles, and the other one was doing it in kilometers. And of course, no one saw this till the reentry. And 150 million dollars uh, later, I mean, all my friends use only metric, but that's only when we're buying drugs or ammo. You know, when we're going, uh, when we need to buy nine millimeter shells uh, for our handgun to go buy a gram. Uh, that's the only time we use metric. But uh, my gosh, I have to tell you, um, my dad's 
I'll, I'll end on this. I don't want to keep you up all night, but I'll, I'll tell you. Um, my dad on his vacation, he, he just liked to see two things. He wanted to go to the biggest theme park. So that was all the Six Flags over Texas, Kansas City, Met America, St. Louis, and the Disney's and all that. But on the way, he liked to stop at every com- company that made something, manufactured something, and gave tours. So, like, when we went to buy our new station wagon, we drove to Detroit and got in a, this little thing pulled by a golf cart and watched our car go from one end. I can still remember a little boy like, rolling out into the parking lot. Um, he stopped by St. Louis. Uh, we saw Budweiser, Coors. We saw Coors. Adolph Coors uh, made his own bottles. And actually, the scientist in the bottle factory made the first dental porcelain. Um And then, so I carried that on with my kids. I remember one time I got an RV and we drove to California all the way up the ocean to Canada, all the way down to Minneapolis, St. Paul, where my oldest sister was in a, in a Catholic uh, Carmelite monastery there. And then all the way back. And, um, and I stopped at, you know, 1-800 Dennis and Fred Joyle gave the tour. Um, uh, my gosh, um, um, ADAC and, um, the late, uh, founder and his wife spent half the day with my four boys. So I love that stuff. But I have to tell you, I've, I've lectured a thousand times and in, in 50 countries. And when you're in Germany and Japan, it is just a scale difference. Like you go into a hundred million dollar companies in America and I don't want to say any names cause it'll piss them off and they might uh, get mad, but it'd be uh, like dead Matt in Santa Marie. It'd be ultra dent and uh, um, South Jordan, Utah. It'd be uh, all, all these hundred million dollar companies. They don't have a PhD. But they all got a, a telemarketing call center. I mean, that's what America does. They're calling, dialing for dollars. We know how to sell. And then you go to Germany and uh, Japan. They, they don't have a call center. They, a lot of them don't even have a marketing department. Or the marketing department looks like uh, the meanest librarian you've ever met in your life. I mean, that that's not what their focus is. They, they got the PhDs. I mean, I remember going into Ivoclare. I mean, they I think they had 70 or 80 PhDs, and they all got doctorates in math and organic. And, and like, if you ask a question like, where's the bathroom in America? Some poor receptionist will just have to get asked that question five times a day, five days a week, till as long as she, until she dies. In Germany, you say, where's the bathroom? And they'll think, oh. Someone doesn't know what the bathroom is. Let's draw a red line from this spot all the way to the bathroom. And the blue one will be the girls' room. And the pink one will be the front. I mean, you can look at every switch. And there's instructions about when to turn this light on and off. I mean, I'm going to never forget when they rolled out the space shuttle. Because I know America likes to always say, well, we were the first country that went to the moon. Yeah, with a bunch of stolen German scientists. It's kind of like when Boston <laughs> says, oh, we won the the uh, the Stanley Cup in hockey. Yeah, with not one person born in the United States of America. I mean, you know, if you, you know, uh, they, they, they should give that award for where the people were born. And uh, they were all Germans. I mean, Germany went to the moon uh, via NASA. And uh, but anyway, when they rolled out that space, it had this big, big triangle pointing to the fuel tank. It's like the Americans are like, well, you know, I'm not actually a rocket scientist, but I know where my fuel tank is when I take my car to gas it. I don't need some damn arrow that big, bigger than a human. And I'm just like, dude, that's German. That's German engineering. There are no mistakes. And if they have to put an arrow there the size of an elephant to make sure some dumbass doesn't put the fuel in the wrong hole, uh, mainly the non-German Americans uh, that would be flying it, um, you know, I mean, it's just amazing. And um, and they don't understand. They, they're not going to get in there on the message boards and fight. And, uh, my gosh, they could, uh, they, they'll show me posts on Dental Town. And this is what I see. Um, and this is what I want to beat up my homies for in America. And that is this. Um, when you go to the uh, IDF meeting in uh, um, Copenhagen, um, there's no speakers. Because speakers would be an engineering, it'd be an added element for something to go wrong. Remember, when you're in engineering, you want the least number of moving parts. In fact, you don't even want any moving parts. It's like when these, uh, te- when these Tesla rockets go up. I mean, it's just oxygen and methane making methyl ox. There's no moving parts or pumps or anything like that. It's a controlled explosion. And, uh, my gosh, when the Germans... Remember, they make Mercedes-Benz, and you make the the Pinto. Uh, you know, um, my gosh, when you go there, they, all the Germans want to talk to the owner. I mean, it's his company. He probably thinks about it 18 hours a day, seven days a week. He has all his money invested into it. They want to speak to that guy. 
Oh, not Americans. are like, oh, I don't trust that guy. He's trying to sell something. I'm like, well, what are you, a public health dentist doing free dentistry in a homeless shelter? Hell no. You're trying to sell $1,000 <laughs> crowns, you moron. Um, you're just projecting your own uh, um, guilt, obviously, of selling stuff without merit. And um, my gosh, um, you go there, and the owner knows more than anything, and then the owner will get on Dental Town. They'll show me all this complete crap like you'll go to some lecture and they'll say well you know in the bonnie age and you know i don't really like acetone i like alcohol but this guy doesn't even have a pg he couldn't even go to the whiteboard and draw the organic chemistry of alcohol versus acetone i mean they're just talking out of their ass and um you know they, they and, and not only that they're an expert in everything i mean they're an expert in endo perio pedo they just know everything but the guy that owns that one company he only knows one damn thing. I'll never forget when I was in Israel. Uh, my gosh, those imp- the owners of those implant companies. Here I was a dentist. Um, here this guy's never even placed an implant. And he could just talk me till my eyes rolled back in the head about the sterilization. Uh, I mean, one, one of the things that blew my mind was that when they're rinsing it, you know, they rinse it until the colony formations are almost gone. Uh, but when they ever get, they get to zero, as soon as they stop the CFU start coming back again. And and they're looking at me like, I, I don't know if this is just some property of life. I don't know if it's spontaneous combustion, but I hear this one deal where he had like been bathing it for like a year. And he goes, and every time I stop, the CFU's light life comes back. I mean, but anyway, they, they know that. They, they, they trust that. And they, they know the owner's name is behind it. Uh, but I'll tell you this, man, when you go on vacation, do that. Take your kids to these dental companies because I remember when I was in SB before it got sold uh, to uh, 3M and all, all those companies. Uh, um, uh, what's the other one out there? What's the big burr company um, in oh, Germany? Uh, Meis- there's Meisinger and Comet. Comet, they call it. Yeah, Comet. And, uh, and then the, what's the other one um, that used to be owned by Danaher? Uh, oh, got oh, rolled uh, up. Br- um, Bras- Bras- Brassler. Brasler, Peter Brasler, one of the best drinkers right. on earth. My God, he was one of the few people that could drink me under the table and was still ready to go uh, for another yeah. two hours. But no, I'm talking about the, uh, what's the other ger- big German company? Um, uh, there's, there's one called Akurata. Um, um, uh, pro- yeah, the ones uh, I know are Comet, Meisinger, uh, Co- uh, Akurata, and uh, Brasler. Brasler. No, there's another one. Um, da- um, Dana Her Dental Companies that got spun off into Invista. Um, oh, Cavo. Cavo. Oh. I, I mean, yeah. I mean, Cavo. I mean, I mean, it, it was like it was like a Swiss watch factory. I mean, Noble yeah. BioCare. I mean, it, the, the, the German engineering is at a different level, and you wouldn't know it. Because when you live in America, you, you, you know, when, when you say this is the greatest country on earth, you're only telling me one thing. You've never seen another country because you can't see Germany, Switzerland, Austria, and Tokyo and um, think this is the greatest country in the world. I mean, they're just more organized or more clean. Everything works. Every, I mean, it's just, my gosh. Um, and, and I bought two American cars. I was trying to be that American guy, and I thought my two uh, Suburbans should have came with a free mechanic living in the trunk. And uh, I told my boys, I said, you know, only two countries make a car, Japan and Germany. Pick, pick a country, pick a car. And one of them wanted the American Jeep. Oh, my God. He's almost paid the entire price of that Jeep just keeping it running. Um, but anyway, um, German engineering went to the moon, uh, not America. And, uh, my gosh, um, those German companies. But after you've been in several, compa- uh, several dental companies, you can't walk through um, the, um, gosh darn, dental company from one end to the other and have their clinical dentist or their head uh, PhD. I, I like to talk to the PhDs. Uh, I already know the dental side. I want to hear the PhD side and not forever remember what the hell went on. I mean, to show, touch, feel. When you're in there seeing the emperor gum made, um, it's it's a, it's lifelong learning. And, and those companies, um, or maybe I should do it more, but more people need to go into those companies with their iPhone and, and show the principle in a five-minute video or less. You know, that's what you should do. You should walk in there and say, I'm at this this company, and here's their main product, and let me tell you why. And then when they the, the, my homies see it, they'll, they'll get it and they'll understand it. But uh, 
Love that stuff. But, hey, man, love you. Big fan of your post forever. And uh, that just means you're old. And, uh, my gosh, um, thank you so much for your 757 posts. I mean, most of my posts are like LOL and I agree or disagree. Yours are all profound. Uh, thanks for coming on the show past your bedtime. And uh, thanks for all you do for uh, Dental Town right. and Dentistry. Look me up when you're in Germany. We'll have a beer. Oh, a a beer. I thought you said you had some Irish in you. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, I, yeah. the rest would be, you know, Jameson. <laughs> no, no, no. We'll drink the whole night away. Uh, yeah. Not a beer, the whole night away. But uh, yeah, <laughs> next time I go to, um, how far are you from Cologne? Uh, well, it's it's a day's drive from Cologne. But you know, it's about three hours on the ice, basically on the fast train. So, so let me tell you, I'm glad. I'm so glad you brought that up because when you're over there in Cologne, um, your pass comes with a, the free train ride, and you get in line. And um, here's the deal: the Germans want to go from point A to B as fast as they can, so you want to get on that three-hour train and boom. But you're not from America; you're you're from the United States. The oldest train is the cheapest price, and it's rickety down the rivers with total views. When you get in those high-speed trains, you're in tunnels and bullets and walls, and you don't see anything. And every time you try to get on those old trains, some beautiful little helpful cologne German girl's like, no, 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 you can get on the on the high-speed train. And you're like, I don't want the high-speed train. I want the slowest train crawling down the river. And, oh, my <laughs> God, that train is so cool. I mean, you can sit there after dinner and say, I don't know, where do you want to go you want to go to paris you want to go to amsterdam um but we we stayed in germany for the most part just looking at dental companies and getting into the seeing those dental companies is so mind-blowing but uh love cologne germany it's the largest meeting in dentistry uh they have over a hundred thousand people they only show up every they only have a meeting every other year because that's the product cycle that, that's how germans think yeah. well okay we released this bonding agent so we'll have a two-year deadline to release the next bonding agent or the implant or whatever. So they have, you know, everything's methodical. And when they roll that thing out, it is at Cologne, Germany, and everyone's there. And it's so cool. You're listening to some owner talk about whatever. And the guy, I mean, it's just flip a coin where the guy's standing. You're talking to some guy, and it's kind of rude. You always want to say, so where are you from? But every country on earth, it's so damn cool. Uh, Got to go to that meeting, and it's made so many Americans multimillionaires because it'll be some, like, really hot technology, and this company's from South Korea, and they're just, um, you know, they don't have the money to get it out. And then I've seen uh, my friends buy the U.S. distribution rights uh, to that company, and later, um, um, you know, they're, they're gazillionaires. So um, it's a yeah. good place. I remember one time I was looking at a product, as Owen and Auden, and guess who grabbed it out of my hand? Dan Fisher of Ultradent. He goes, uh, Howard, 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 let, let me see that. I mean, I mean it's every, everybody's, it's like a fish freeding frenzy. But uh, all right, buddy, have a great day. Right, what time go. is it there Thank in you. Germany now? All right, it's uh, it's almost 10 o'clock, 9.47 here. All right, well, you stayed up too late. Have a good night. All right, Thank <laughs> Bye -bye. Good night, bye. We love our technology. You've seen this many times before. I call this the screen hunch and it's everywhere. It's a change in posture on a global scale. Screen hunch is an unnatural position that's leading to an epidemic of premature neck and back problems in teens and adults. This is normal and healthy posture. Notice the ear hole is directly over the shoulder with no signs of early spinal degeneration. However, if you stand like this, sit like this, or walk like this, or even this, you may already be a part of this epidemic. Hello, I'm Dr. Devin Savage, and I've been a dentist for more than 20 years. I love my career, and I love my technology. My tech use and work posture left me in pain by the end of the day. I tried a number of treatments and devices, and I didn't want to become dependent on medications. I found out that many friends, relatives, and patients were also suffering with back and neck pain. We all had a common problem. Our neck and back pain was not being treated effectively, or in many cases, relief was very temporary. So I asked myself, what if you could fix your neck and upper back problems with one simple device? That was more than three years ago. I dove into the science of spinal traction. I built prototypes and I tested them. My results have broken new ground in spinal traction technology. 
Introducing the Archlifter. The Archlifter is a new and unique cervical traction device that relieves the tension and pain that build up after a hard day's work. The Archlifter is designed to apply traction forces precisely to give you the neck and back pain relief you need in under a minute per day. The Archlifter will debut on the market with the precision machined steel professional version. It's strong enough to be used in a hospital, clinic, or doctor's office and is affordable enough for home use. The Archlifter uses balanced traction forces by applying those forces to the front and the back of the head. Dr. Savage recognized that the upper dental arch and the roof of the mouth are the best places to withstand traction forces in the front of the head. Combined with the occipital area in the back of the head, these traction points are capable of suspending the body weight very comfortably and safely. Spinal discs give the spine its flexibility. During normal function, water and nutrients cycle in and out of the discs. Our modern lifestyle often causes us to lean forward, resulting in unequal forces acting on the neck and back. These unequal forces can produce disc wedging, resulting from constant forward head posture, screen hunch, gravity, and other factors. The arch lifter eliminates this problem by delivering precise balanced traction forces to decompress your neck and back, providing relief and helping to restore your natural spinal curvature. The arch lifter is easy to use. You need a sturdy overhead support such as a pull-up bar. Hang the arch lifter on the bar using the supplied attachments. The lifting angle is adjustable by selecting the desired setting and inserting the locking pin. You can adjust your feet for the most comfortable traction angle. You control the traction forces by bending your knees or holding on to the handles. The arch lifter can be used in the gym on an appropriate weight machine. Simply remove the bar and attach the arch lifter. Select your traction weight and start decompression of your neck and back immediately after your workout or any time. Dr. Savage consulted with Priority Designs of Columbus, Ohio for medical design, prototyping, and manufacturability engineering services. Dr. Savage approached us and he sent some images of, of uh, his concept and the prototype that he had built along with some conceptual renderings. When Dr. Savage described the initial concept to us, we were kind of like, whoa, that's different. And uh, I think seeing him and the pictures of him fully suspended from it was kind of like, okay, uh, I, I get it now. So that was, that was kind of unique. I'm a mechanical engineer here at Priority Designs. Um, I specialize in uh, manufacturing aspect uh, as well as testing. Changing an idea to something that's easier for a factory to assemble and have a high level of tolerance and uh, quality. Uh, the coolest thing I found about this project was the kind of um, anatomy hack. By lifting from the upper jaw, you can support the whole body's weight without localizing the stress through the jaw. I served in uh, two conflicts, so I'm a, I'm a combat vet. Because of what I, uh, what I did, my body sustained some, you know, some heavy use. The arch lifter is giving me the forcible traction that will not only relieve the pain that I've had in my neck, but also allow me to have the, uh, the range of motion that I had when I was a kid. I am in the dental profession and I spend most of my day hunched over patients in a very awkward position. It was brought to my attention about six months ago that I have what is forward head position or tech neck is another cool name for it where your, your um, head is positioned more forward than the alignment of your shoulders. When using this device for the first time, I definitely was out of my comfort zone because it was something new. But as soon as um, I got it in my position and he explained to me how you use it, it was very comfortable and I didn't want to get up. My children had asked me if I knew where I could purchase an arch lifter and I told them no, not yet. And they were really bummed and they went ahead and told me that they could see how much it helped me and how much it, it affected not only my posture but my personality and my tolerance and because I wasn't so stressed or strained that they wanted to get it for me for Mother's Day. But I thought it was really cool that they even noticed a difference. I'm as a neuroscientist, I'm as a researcher since 20 years. I'm working in the University Hospital of Tübingen, Germany. And as a researcher, I spent like 10 to 12 hours per day at least at the computer. After some years, it started to cause me a lot of like neck pain and upper back pain. So first I tried it, I guess like for 30 seconds. 
know, first for 30 seconds. And after first use for 30 seconds, I had before this pain. I get out of the arch lifter and the pain was gone. It was amazing. I would tell a person that had a problem like I got right now that the arch lifter is probably the only source that you're going to be able to use to prevent from getting any kind of surgery done. I use it at least twice a day. I usually do it in the morning and I do it in the evening when I get home and that. When I first started getting relief off it was after about a week after I was able to get it adjusted to a proper or it was equal to where I got. So once it started pulling on the spine and sort of like sometimes it'd be a little pop in there and that stuff and that. That's when about a few days after that it was a little sore but then that's when I started getting more relief. By using this arch lifter it has helped. It does help a lot. I work at a many stories that we bought several years ago and I brought the uh, garage door down right on the top of my head. It damaged my neck. The arch lifter helped me to be able to sit up straighter, keep my head up. It increased the flexibility of the muscles in my neck. And as soon as those go on the market, I'm buying one. As a dentist, much of my career has been centered around prevention. I always tell my patients not to wait until it hurts. As a patient, I've learned that posture-related spinal degeneration is optional. Thanks to the arch lifter, you can get ahead of your neck and back pain. Prevention can be achieved in just minutes. You spend more time brushing your teeth. Make sure to view the videos and comments below to hear from actual arch lifter users, and please help us spread the word. Thank you.